in the skies over California, some of the strangest images ever seen. This actually was taken in Bakersfield, California. Craft that seemingly defy the rules of physics. Like some of the world's most advanced technology, there are allegations that these designs may have come from beyond the stars. Is it possible that world governments have been secretly reverse engineering crashed UFOs, creating technological marvels that seem to appear out of nowhere? I shouldn't be talking about it. Does the SR-71 Blackbird spy plane owe its revolutionary design to the UFO sightings reported by its creator? Is it just coincidence the B-2 stealth bomber and the F-117 fighter jet resemble the craft described in the first modern UFO sighting. There was an object in the sky. He actually saw what was almost like a stealth fighter. Are these military drone aircraft reverse engineered from captured UFOs? I've never seen something like this before. Our technology has advanced exponentially over the past 60 years more quickly than our ability to deal with its consequences. We're playing with time travel, we're playing with telekinesis. But is some of our most advanced technology not our own? This is case number 47204, Reverse Engineering. The team from UFO Magazine is in Fort Collins, Colorado, looking at the strangest evidence of reverse engineering in recent years. This actually was taken allegedly in Bakersfield, California, showing a very obviously clear craft. It looks very sophisticated. The photo was posted anonymously on an internet public forum. The craft is hoop-shaped, with spires on top that presumably provide some sort of lift or propulsion. James Carrion is the international director of MUFON, the Mutual UFO Network, founded in 1969 to scientifically and objectively investigate UFOs. It has become one of the outstanding resources for UFO research. Another series of photos came out May 16, Capitola, California. This photo was posted by someone using a different screen name, but it seems to show the same craft in a different part of the state. Now, after these initial images came out, uh, in May, uh, another series of images were reported directly to MUFON's website, allegedly taken by a cell phone. Three sets of photos, seemingly of the same craft. What is the correlation? Most of the locations are near Saratoga, California, and that's not all. Nearby are NASA's Ames Research Center, and 10 miles away, Moffett Field, also now administered by NASA. This has added to the speculation that the craft, whatever it is, is a creation of the United States government. This last series of photos that came out in Big Basin, California in June, if you look closely enough at them, you'll see that they have on them symbols. The cryptic symbols on the drone's body do not resemble any known alphabet but one person has come forward claiming to know their origin. A gentleman named Isaac claimed that he recognized the symbols that were on these drone craft because he worked on them under a secret government project back in the 1980s uh, called the Carrot Program. In June 2007, a man identifying himself as Isaac posted a letter on the internet claiming he had been an engineer for a secret government program called CARAT, Commercial Application Research for Extraterrestrial Technology. He backed up his claims by posting documents which he had allegedly stolen from CARAT and photocopied. Quote, the military was hard at work trying to understand and use the extraterrestrial artifacts it had in its possession. MUFON has been investigating the claims and analyzing the carrot documents to assess Isaac's credibility. So he released a series of documentation, and these were the major allegations. He believes these craft uh, use invisibility technology. 
that the reason they were seen by these uh, photo witnesses is because the invisibility cloak was disrupted by some non-human technology. The claims from this elusive witness may seem extreme, but scientists, engineers, and experts the world over believe that governments have been reverse engineering alien craft for the past 60 years. But such claims have never before been supported with documents and photographs as clear and detailed as these. Check this out. What if there was this reverse engineering program going on, and then these are like little test flights happening in the sky? So for me to get a better sense of this, we need to get some image analysts to review those, experts in their fields who could look at the case here and give us their expert opinion. Look, I'll tell you one thing. Reverse engineering is very, very tough to prove, extremely tough to prove. But there are some incredible experts in the field and see what their take is on what's been reverse engineering technology. So, Pat, let's collect this material. Let's get to the experts. You got it. The team travels to Littleton, Colorado, to meet an engineer who claims to have first-hand knowledge that government reverse engineering programs are real. I never talked about that for years because I felt that it was a classified thing and I, I shouldn't be talking about it. John Schusler worked for NASA during the Gemini and Apollo programs from 1962 until his retirement in 1998. His introduction into UFO phenomenon began with NASA's Gemini missions. On the first Gemini flight, it was the Gemini Titan II. It was an unmanned mission. January 19, 1965, the Gemini Titan II rocket launches into space at 2.03 p.m. Minutes later, as the rocket makes its suborbital flight, Schusler notices something anomalous. When that came around the Earth the first time, it was reported there were two objects with it. And they were spotted by radar, and on the second time around, they were gone. This mysterious event was the beginning of a wave of sightings UFO experts believe were witnessed by astronauts. June 4, 1965, the Gemini 4 capsule orbits above Hawaii. Astronaut James McDivitt mans the controls while his partner, Ed White, sleeps. Suddenly, an object appears outside the window. McDivitt describes it as a cylindrical object with a long arm jutting out from one side. He takes two photographs, then, fearing the capsule might hit the object, he turns on the rocket engines and moves the spacecraft to a safer location. When he looks out the window again, the object is gone. He was very candid about saying that he did see something that wasn't ours. It was a guy who was a general in the Air Force. Uh, he was a well-known fighter pilot and dead serious when he said something's going on. NORAD's official explanation was that the object was the discarded second stage of the Titan II rocket. But while McDivitt insisted that it wasn't what he saw, he never filed a UFO report and declined to speak publicly on his sighting. Schusler began compiling documents detailing NASA's UFO encounters, describing what the craft looked like and how they flew. His investigations didn't go unnoticed. I, I shouldn't be talking about it. In fact, I was called in and asked for some documents, UFO documents, by an advanced design group designing a, a stealth fighter. And I turned over to them a bunch of my files so they could look and see if there was a, a reverse engineering stealth technology. But before long, that group was working stealth technology. Stealth is one of many astounding technologies developed over the past 60 years. Since the 1940s, technology has progressed at a seemingly exponential rate. Transistors and microcircuitry have revolutionized electronics. Advances in aviation materials allow our planes to fly faster than was previously believed possible. But did we do it alone? A landmark event coincides with the beginning of the technological revolution. Was the timing coincidental, or is there a connection? July 7, 1947. A flying disc is alleged to have crashed at Roswell, New Mexico. Witnesses have testified that the object was immediately taken away by the U.S. Army. You believe that there must have been a crash somewhere along the line, or somehow we acquired 
a, one of these vehicles. Technology items suddenly burst onto the scene in two or three locations at once. Like they've all been fed as some seed, you know, to make it grow, and they all come to similar conclusions. What pieces of technology? Fiber optics were reported in the early crashes. They didn't call them fiber optics, but uh, they looked like gra glass wires or something. Invisibility. We had lots of reports that UFOs were flying along, being chased, and suddenly they're gone. They check with the ground, they get ground track radar on it, they have aircraft visual and aircraft radar that you could not see. Many technological advances being unveiled today were described years ago by UFO witnesses. Just recently, it was said that they can make a, a tank look invisible by projecting uh, the image behind it in front of it, you know, and you can't even see a tank sitting on the ground. British defense researchers recently made a tank invisible by projecting the background image onto a special foreground surface. UFO witnesses have long reported craft apparently disappearing in front of their eyes. You were there. What was the scuttlebutt in that community? Were people talking? The guys talk about things of very unusual nature to each other, but they don't talk to people outside of that community. The special access community is a very close community, and you will lie, cheat, or steal to protect it. And uh, it's necessary to be that way. Would you uh, have heard any rumors? Uh, who's got what? I would not say that on camera. <laughs> I asked him straight up, you know, okay, well, you know people, you, you know, who've you talked to? Who's got the stuff? Who's got the goods? Where's the, where's this craft being, being kept? Yeah, you, don't want, you don't want me shot, do you? <laughs> and he basically said, no, I can't tell you that. Schusler is certain that reverse engineering of downed UFOs is being done secretly. There's just way too many advancements coming out and people don't really know what's going on behind the scenes. Advanced technologies have long and complicated histories, making it difficult to trace their development. But one aviation expert has noticed striking similarities between a UFO and a revolutionary U.S. aircraft. March Air Force Base, Riverside County, California. Aircraft journalist Bernard Tornell has studied the sudden invention of the SR-71, more commonly referred to as the Blackbird. The piece de résistance of the Cold War. Lockheed designer Clarence Kelly Johnson defied all conventional aeronautical design when he created the SR-71. Its flattened shape and tapering sides reduced its radar signature to a minimum. Aircraft of comparable size to the Blackbird appear on radar screens the size of a flying house, but the SR-71 appears the size of just the front door. Even more astounding, Kelly achieved this effect 25 years before the stealth fighter was unveiled. It was the first craft to be comprised mainly of titanium and one of the first attempts in stealth design. Where did Kelly Johnson's advanced ideas come from? That blended wing fuselage, the stubby wings, and the huge tail surfaces, yeah. a plane that by right shouldn't fly. You're saying that the designer of the SR-71 was inspired by a UFO sighting? Johnson had two verified encounters with UFOs and subsequently filed reports of both sightings. Was his sketch of a UFO the first blueprint of an SR-71? In December 1964, the SR-71 was unveiled. Its Mach 3 cruising speed, titanium airframe, and revolutionary stealth technology astounded aviation experts. But some wondered if these advances were somehow related to designer Kelly Johnson's reports of seeing UFOs. Johnson died in 1990 without answering the question. Kelly Johnson conceived really the aircraft from A to Z. He conceived the U-2 the same way. Now, Clarence Kelly had a UFO sighting. November 15, 1951, Agora, California. Johnson witnesses a strange object in the sky with a swept back flying wing shape, unlike any known aircraft of that time. Suddenly he saw something uh, uh, elliptic, very metallic mm -hmm. and very huge dimension. And there was also another sighting he had. December 15, 1953, Two years later, Johnson notices a dark elliptical shape hovering motionless in the sky. 
Suddenly, it begins accelerating at impossibly fast speed. You saw a strange craft with two exos going very fast. It was not jet, and he didn't know what it was. Johnson made detailed notes and a sketch of that object. He believed it to be approximately 200 feet wide, hovering at an altitude of 15,000 feet and about 30 to 60 miles away. His sketch of the enigmatic object strongly resembles the plane he designed 13 years later. He mentioned that he cannot explain what he saw, but the most interesting thing is another crew was flying at the same time. Johnson's UFO sighting was independently confirmed by two Lockheed pilots on a WV-2 test flight near Long Beach, California. It can corroborate what they saw. The two pilots both reported seeing the same dark shape and echoed Johnson's estimate of the object's altitude and speed. We have to remember that Clarence Kelly Johnson was the founder of Lockheed Skunk Works, an aerospace company that went on to design some of the most advanced flying craft in the world. So this was no average engineer. And one has to wonder, was his sketch of a UFO the first blueprint of an SR-71? It would be incredibly interesting as an engineer or scientist to try to reverse engineer something like a UFO. An engineer can take the knowledge they have and see some hints towards how to evolve it. Whatever the source of his inspiration, Kelly Johnson's SR-71 was the first of an ongoing stream of ever more sophisticated stealth designs. The SR-71 has had an impact on every military plane in the sky today. The SR-71 is not the only plane whose revolutionary design raised questions about its origin. When the B-2 stealth bomber and the F-117 stealth fighter were unveiled, their flying wing shape was revolutionary. But even more astounding is their lack of radar signature. Due to a revolutionary top secret skin that UFO researchers believe also to be reverse engineered, the airplanes are completely undetectable while flying. Ufologists immediately remembered the first modern UFO sighting in 1947 when pilot Kenneth Arnold saw unknown flying wing-shaped objects over Mount Rainier, Washington. People believe that Kenneth Arnold saw a saucer in the sky. Wrong. What Kenneth Arnold actually saw was almost a delta wing shape, almost like a stealth fighter. The craft that actually crashed at Roswell was not a flying saucer. It was a flying crescent. Today's flying wing designs are almost direct descendants of the modified blended flying wing that crashed at Roswell. A flying wing aircraft blends the fuselage into the wings, creating a wedge-shaped plane. Although a flying wing has superior lift and fuel efficiency, historically it's proved hard to maneuver. The Germans produced a jet-powered flying wing aircraft in 1944. But pressures of war kept designers from solving the craft's many technical difficulties. The US Air Force began developing flying wing aircraft, but shut down the program in 1948, when a crash killed two test pilots and three engineers. Was technology taken from the Roswell crash responsible for the eventual perfection of the flying wing? If these UFOs existed and they were just thousands of years more advanced than what we are familiar with today, I'm not sure that we would be able to understand it. Reverse engineering entails copying everything from an existing machine, from complicated electronics down to the chemical composition of basic materials. It's no easy task, even when the technology being copied is from right here on Earth. The B-29 bomber is probably the best example of reverse engineering. Through the Cold War, World War II, World War I, the military has been doing reverse engineering uh, of foreign aircraft, famous cases of, of the U.S. getting their hands on Russian aircraft and reverse engineering the functionality or some of the advanced performance characteristics of the Russian aircraft, and it goes both ways. The Russians are doing the same thing to us. It's undisputed that countries routinely reverse engineer technologies from other countries. Could they be applying the same techniques to objects not of this world? Stanley gave the order, if we can get uh, B-29, try to rebuild it. July 31st, 1944. A B-29 bomber experiences engine problems and is forced to land near Vladivostok, USSR. Later, two other B-29s also make emergency landings in Russia. 
another crashes in Siberia. All four craft are kept by the Soviets. Their reverse engineering effort creates the Tupolev Tu-4. The Russian were ordered to rebuild the B-29 bolt per bolt, uh, one and grown, 5,000 pieces. Ironically, highly complex machinery is not always the biggest challenge. The Russians were not able to reproduce everything. Look at the Russians with the B-29 having difficulty just to make a small step forward. Now imagine getting a UFO that might be so incredibly sophisticated, so incredibly advanced. It could be from a civilization thousands of years engineering-wise ahead of us. Maybe we could reproduce the geometries of those components in that UFO, but for us to understand the fundamental physics, that's a huge stretch. The claim that the U.S. government is actively engaged in reverse engineering alien craft has always been highly controversial. But recently, new material has been released purporting to be photographic and documentary evidence of recovered alien technology. Proof at last, or something else? Whoa. Today's mainstream technology could have been wholly developed by our planet's cleverest species, us. But the idea that we've reverse engineered some devices from alien technology continues to intrigue. As with these photographs, allegedly of U.S. military drones inspired by real UFOs. MUFON director James Carrion notes striking similarities between the photographs of the purported military drone and a famous UFO crash in Pennsylvania. December 9, 1965. Thousands of people in six states and Ontario, Canada, report seeing a brilliant fireball streak overhead. A number of frantic calls from witnesses were recorded on tape and still survive. Across the sky came a huge white ball of fire. There was an object in the sky 15 minutes before five. Metallic debris reportedly drops over northern Ohio, and the object causes sonic booms in western Pennsylvania. According to witnesses, it finally lands in the woods outside Kecksburg, Pennsylvania, 30 miles southeast of Pittsburgh. Local firemen rush to the scene, but discover a U.S. military unit has already cordoned off the area. Soldiers reportedly take the mysterious object to an undisclosed location, presumed to be Wright-Patterson Air Force Base in Dayton, Ohio. The official explanation is that a meteor has crashed. But numerous witnesses and newspapers believe that this was, in fact, a UFO, and that it has played a key role in the U.S. military's reverse engineering program. If you look at eyewitness information who actually saw the Kecksburg object, they saw it make a 25-degree trajectory change and some sort of intelligent control when it came down. And eyewitness testimony states that what they found was an intact craft on the ground. It had made a trench where it had come down after it broke through a bunch of trees, and that it was retrieved intact by the military, put on a flatbed truck, and transported out of the area. Carrion's research has revealed that numerous eyewitnesses of the Kecksburg crash reported seeing strange symbols on the base of the UFO. When the town erected a monument to the crashed object, the symbols were prominently recreated. And now, 40 years after the crash, they are apparently turning up in another context. So we see the correlation between the symbols on the drone craft and the symbols that were seen on the Kecksburg. If the carrot documents are indeed real, they indicate the government may be using private industry to reverse engineer. Private entities have another advantage. They're immune to freedom of information requests. That object that is in that image is completely inconsistent with the physics of aircraft flying. For example, the mass distribution or the center of gravity is way off. So there's no way that could fly through air at high speed. Which leaves me thinking there's some uh, miracle technology that's way beyond anything we can understand. Maybe there's a f it's enveloped in a force field and that's providing the aerodynamics. You know, it's speculation, but it's, it's important to look at the physics of what's being presented. Have you had a chance to analyze this? Oh yeah, these are some of the drone images. Dr. Bruce McAbee was an optical physicist for the United States Navy 
specializing in imagery analysis. He and Ted Ackworth analyzed the drone photographs. You know, these pictures were essentially posted on the internet. I should point out that clearly this is not an aerodynamic type of structure that we're looking yeah, at here. It's, it's if, it's, if it really is real and flying along, it's using some extraordinary means. Uh, it could be extremely lightweight and blowing air downwards, I suppose. It's immediately obvious that these vehicles, if real, defy conventional aerodynamics. In order to fly, they would have to use some unknown method of propulsion and lift. It seems that just about every case, the, the quality of the images is very low. In this case, with the military drones, for once, we have what appear to be very well exposed digital photographs. Wait a second, it's missing, it's missing some pieces of the yeah, craft. Well, you've done and this is it early? Maccabee notes that one of the earliest photographs, allegedly taken in May 2007, differs from a photo said to be taken a month later. The most recent image shows a more highly developed craft. And this is it early? So I said this is a more developed version of it. So you're saying that there, there are a series of images that were posted that right. show a progression of features on the craft? Well, you can see how this initial version was. It had spires or spikes mm -hmm. that came up. It had a circular donut-shaped main body. It had a tail going out to the side and right. a spike coming off. And yet, head. over some sequent uh, images, it's developed or, or grown more yeah, let's see components. Have them. Either that means this craft is actually deploying additional hardware or parts, or somebody is building up a CGI model and developing the complexity of the model over the sequence of the photos. All of this stuff that's uh, been presented around this Isaac case and these drones, it's all very interesting. But all of this hinges on the testimony of some guy named Isaac. Uh, I'd need some kind of evidence to, to support this. And I think we'd have to investigate this further to really uh, know if any of this is true. Is this real or is it a hoax? Just the search for the truth only adds more layers to the enigma. These photographs, reportedly shot over California in 2007, show craft possibly reverse engineered by our government from captured alien technology. Although the Carrick documents allege that reverse engineering is being subcontracted out to private facilities, most UFO researchers believe that if it's taking place, it's being done at high security military bases. I'm coming up with a lot of documents here uh, about underground bases and, and their connection to reverse engineering. The file includes a declassified, formerly top secret 1952 briefing prepared for incoming president Dwight Eisenhower. This says top secret, eyes only. It's prepared for president-elect Eisenhower, and it goes on to say that the Roswell crash was real and the wreckage of the craft was removed to several different locations, one of them possibly Area 51. Two names have become synonymous with reverse engineering, Dulce Mesa, New Mexico, and Area 51. A number of scientists and engineers who worked at Area 51 reported suspicious activity at the site. Robert Lazar supposedly was one of the people who was asked by the Air Force mm. to go to Area 51 and give his advice on how to reverse engineer the propulsion systems of all the craft that were kept at Area 51. Bob Lazar surfaced in the early 1990s, claiming to have been an engineer who worked at Area 51 supposedly reverse engineering captured UFOs. Here's a story about a guy named Bill Uhaus, who uh, is a retired mechanical engineer from Vegas, who claims he worked with an EBE, an extraterrestrial biological, biological entity. entity. Right. Another purported base involved with reverse engineering is located underneath the town of Dulce, New Mexico. Dulce is a very secret military base that is underground. According to the United States Army's own mining engineers, this is the most heavily tunneled area in the entire world, that ever since the late 1940s, we've dug tunnels in all these states. Dulce is one of those tunnels. I know that there are bases that are tunneled deep into the ground for their protection so that they can survive, let's say, a, a nuclear attack. But are there these secret underground bases where reverse engineering vehicles? That I can't say for sure. A subject surrounded by secrecy is always an easy target for hoaxers. And digital image manipulation has made their job easier than ever, which isn't to say that the photographs aren't real. 
Ted meets with computer graphics specialist Phil Crescenzo right. at his studio in Agora, California to analyze the drone photographs. The light for these objects appears to be coming from this angle. Right. You know, I'm right. not sure that that's the same angle that the light for the telephone pole. If anything, I would say that it's deceptive. Phil has noticed that all the photographs show the craft moving toward or away from a wooded area, but never over it. None of these shots really have the ship behind woods, where right. you would think someone, if they saw a craft like this, would be shooting constantly, and one or two of these shots would have it behind a lot right. more foliage. Yep. That it's much easier to make a composite when you have all these straight lines, and for instance, if you were to try to put this craft behind a, a number of leaves, and I noticed that in this whole sequence of images, there are none where the craft is behind anything. You know, either it's a really, really well-crafted hoax or a real image. It, it leaves me wondering, you know, what would it take to create these kinds of fake photos. You remember the frame that I told you to look? This shot. This is it right here. Yeah. I shot it yesterday, and I left a nice spot for me to put something into that frame. Mm. I just did a quick approximation of what the lighting might be for this shot and rendered a 3D object out. If I just bring the object in and lay it in the shot, we get a pretty stark image here. To my eye, it, it, it seems clear the object's just stuck on there. Stuck on there. So the first thing, I would render it with some motion blur. Even objects that are moving fairly slow should have some motion blur on them. Does a blur occur on the drone photos? It's, it's, it's sort of one thing that I, I feel like I'm missing when I look at these photos mm -hmm. is a little bit of motion blur. I don't see any rotation. I see no motion blur at all. It appears to be stationary. And that conflicts with the fact that the craft is moving across those telephone wires and moving across some of these parts of the scene. Now, the only thing that this is missing to sort of fit into the shot is to have the grain from the background applied back onto the ship. Right. I mean, look at that. Yeah, it definitely looks a lot better after you've applied those effects. Exactly. Uh, it's impressive. I mean, you, you know, you've got it, to my eye, looking like maybe 99% believable that there's a UFO flying in, in your front yard. But you can see how someone with even more time would probably be able to create a very convincing image. After all of this analysis, you know, what is it? Is, is this real or is it a hoax? I would tend to go with this being a computer generated image. At the end of the day, we weren't able to prove that these were fakes or, or hoaxed. On the other side, we weren't able to prove that they were real. I'm not sure it's possible to do that. And bottom line, you know, I, I'm just not going to believe that we're seeing a real UFO solely based on a set of images. If the carrot photos and documents are fakes, they are extremely good ones. Somebody has spent hours creating and detailing these documents. Why? Why are all the photo witnesses anonymous? Nobody's come forward. We have no identifiable person who says, I've taken these photos. So this whole thing smells like a hoax? Read in between the lines here. And at the top of my list is disinformation. OK. Are they trying to hide real alien technology? Are they trying to hide that we've been visited by extraterrestrials? Or are they just simply trying to hide a super secret weapon? But for me, the bottom line is there is a secret here that's being protected. It's being cloaked, and that's what MUFON's here to find out, what that secret is. It's a matter of record that revolutionary forms of aircraft have been attempted in the years after World War II. Rather than reverse engineer alien technology, most companies all the way back in the 1950s simply created their own technology from scratch. In 1953, Avro Canada demonstrated Project Y2. Yes, a genuine flying saucer. The Avro car was an 18-foot saucer that used a turbo rotor for upward propulsion. But even after spending millions of dollars in research and development, the craft could hover only up to 8 feet at a maximum speed of 20 knots. Other disc-shaped craft all proved unstable, unflyable, and dangerous. But one man claims to have helped build a successful flying disc, not for any government, but for a private organization in Oklahoma. I had an experience on board this 45-foot craft. Ralph Ring is a technician who worked closely in the 1950s and 60s with Otis Carr, an inventor who claimed to be a protege of Nikola Tesla. 
Carr believed he could build a working flying disc. And Ralph Ring asserts they succeeded. Ralph, how did you meet Otis T. Carr? A friend of mine introduced me to a group called Understanding that was studying stuff like science. They brought Carr and his entourage out, and we got up there and brainstormed, and we decided to get together and build spaceships. 1958, Oklahoma. Otis Carr starts construction of the OTC-X1, a 45-foot flying saucer. He describes his invention on Long John Neville's New York radio show in 1959. We have a truly space vehicle that does not burn up its energy in a few seconds. Could make a trip very easily as other aerial transportation systems from here to Baltimore or from here to the moon. Carr claimed to have been shown secret theories and techniques of Nikola Tesla. There is no independent corroboration of Carr's story. Later, Carr claimed to have seen three electrically charged UFOs, which inspired him to use Tesla's theories to create a new form of propulsion. We can accelerate with tremendous velocity. I was selected, and I had two other engineers that got on board. Ralph and two engineers were the first passengers. I had an experience on board of this 45-foot craft. Could you describe the experience? Sure. When we got on board, and Carr said, what we're going to do is we're going to vibrate this craft to that particular frequency, the color of aquamarine. So they fired it up, and uh, this thing turned into this beautiful, brilliant aquamarine. And the whole craft inside was all lit up. With it. And then he said, OK, that's it. He says, uh, come on down to debriefing. That's the end of the experiment. Ring remembers the entire experience lasting only 15 seconds. But that short period of time encompassed something much more phenomenal. And he said, what you did was you went downrange 10 miles and you came back. You resonated here for about 5 to 10 seconds, and where you were was probably equate to about 15 minutes. He said, well, check your pockets. And we had these little jumpsuits on, and mm -hmm. we emptied our pockets out. And it was stones and sticks and grass and everything. We put it, piled it up on his desk. He said, well, where'd that come from? The debris Ring found in his pocket was allegedly from an area 10 miles from the testing site. He asserts he did not have it before the testing of the craft. How come we don't remember it? And he said, well, because the, the brain, it's reached its optimum capacity. Were there any external witnesses extrinsic to the event itself? Yeah. He was a police officer in, in Apple Valley at the time. And him and his buddy saw this craft. I looked up on my email, and the guy says, did you have uh, jumpsuits on? And, and yeah. And he says, well, I think we saw you guys. I mean, you just were there for a few minutes, and you left. They had no idea what was going on. They felt the vibration. Two, there was a bright blue light. Three, they wound up 10 miles away with no sense of movement or any memory of flying there. What does that sound like? It sounds very much like an alien abduction. Otis Carr was using the same techniques that alien abductors use. Could we talk a little bit about you know, what the fundamental principle was or is that makes us? Well, the simple explanation I can give you is you reach a resonant frequency of anything and you you then become, you synergize with it. You become kind of one with it. Because Ring is not a scientist, he has a limited understanding of Carr's theories, other than that Carr believed objects could be moved through space and time by creating a resonant frequency with a predetermined location. Resonance is the specific pitch that triggers an exaggerated oscillation in an object. Every object has its own specific resonant frequency. For example, a tuning fork in the key of C has little effect on a tuning fork in the key of D. But if both tuning forks are in the same key, striking one will cause the other to vibrate in sympathy. Another example is a crystal goblet which can be made to resonate so violently at a certain note that it will actually shatter. We have to remember that sometimes out-of-the-box thinking is very difficult to accept. And there were many great thinkers in the past whose ideas we could not accept. 
people actually laughed at Einstein when he came up with relativity. When the father of American rocketry, Lewis Goddard, proposed the idea that we would one day be in orbit and in space, people thought this would never happen, we would never go into space. So I would be reluctant to dismiss Ralph Ring's claims that there are different energies out there that we have yet to tap into. Carr's theories are so removed from accepted laws of physics that they seem like science fiction. But when experiments producer John Tyndall applied resonant frequency to an object in his laboratory, he was amazed to discover that at least part of what Carr claimed may be valid. What's, what is I don't know much? what kind of resonant frequency Otis Carr was using, but I've set up a basically an acoustic levitation chamber that, that's going to use resonant frequencies to levitate this uh, little flying saucer. This is an acoustic levitation chamber. Basically, I'm going to take this little foam cup and hopefully get it to uh, hover and fly around inside just by using sound waves. What I'm going to do is I'm going to put this into a resonance chamber. The resonance chamber has three speakers placed on the top, the side, and the back, reflecting the three dimensions of space. I have X, Y, and Z axes that I can control from these three oscillators. It's amazing how much and how little energy you need once you hit it. Ah, see? Here it is. Wow. The oscillators are tuned to the resonant frequency of the chamber, which vibrates in sympathy to the tone being generated by the speakers and amplifies it. The intense vibrations set up a standing wave inside the chamber. The cup is actually riding the crest of the standing wave, not unlike a surfer rides the crest of an ocean wave. There you have it. Incredible. <laughs> oh. Can you turn it upside down again? Well, we'll try. There you go. Wow. Nice. Wow. John Tyndall has demonstrated that sound waves can move or levitate an object, which Carr claimed was how he intended to propel his saucer. When you do hit the resonant frequency, all heck breaks loose. All bets are off. How exactly would this relate to the Otis T. Carr experiments and, and UFO well, technology. So if he has stumbled upon some sort of ether resonant frequency that we haven't stumbled upon, then there could be some strange things come out of that. I think it's a big stretch. It doesn't fit any of the existing scientific models that we have, but this idea of finding a resonant frequency to capture, collect energy is an interesting idea. Theory like this, using sound waves to move an object, might have seemed preposterous 25 years ago, but uh, imagine what we might have in another 25 years. Guys, after all this investigation, this case on reverse engineering, I have to admit, I, I remain really skeptical. The testimonies we've collected in the case so far, you know, they seem like reasonably credible people, but in each case, it's been individuals saying that they have eyewitness experience with, with some aspect of reverse engineering. What about all the people we talk to that are so highly credible? Bernard Tunnell, John Schusler of MUFON, they say they, they know of reverse engineering going on, or they know of people who are involved in reverse engineering, and I don't see why we shouldn't believe them. How can you reject that kind of testimony? But we still don't have the actual vehicle. It's easy to say, where's the UFO? That's our job, is to hunt for it. Can we find it? Next to impossible, because they're going to keep it from us. The real truth behind the reverse engineering of purported downed UFOs will probably never be known. There is little hard evidence, only witnesses who contradict each other. Yet it's undisputed that reverse engineering is practiced on conventional items. We're playing with time travel, we're playing with telekinesis, we're playing with psychokinesis, we're playing with a whole bunch of things that are way beyond our human imagination to comprehend, yet we're playing with it. Could we possibly resist the temptation to analyze an advanced craft if one fell into our hands? And if we did manage to learn the secrets of an advanced civilization, would we prove ourselves advanced enough to use them wisely?